Well, uh, it's great pleasure to, uh, to have uh, Peter Sarnak uh, during the second day of uh, Sasha Nielman's birthday conference. Uh, so the second day is more about quantum chaos and the first talk uh, by Peter is on ergodic properties of eigenfunctions after Schnirlman. Peter. Well, thanks. It's a great honor and a pleasure to uh, speak on this occasion. Um, I think there's some noise somewhere. Anyway, uh, you can hear me? Somebody's got their, I can hear a kid. Uh, okay, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to talk on this occasion. Actually, I understand it's uh, Sasha's birthday today, so uh, that's uh, particularly pleasurable. And as we heard yesterday, Sasha is a mathematician, a sort of unique type, he's extremely original, He's not written that much, but what he writes has had a tremendous impact, allowed other people to do things. In fact, uh, on looking on Matt Sinet, I noticed that he has 26 publications, at least according to them. And that was a number that's also uh, the number of papers written by my PhD advisor, Paul Cohen. Oh. Uh, and uh, it's quite remarkable that people who uh, think and only write original things and don't uh, get involved in this modern way of writing many, many papers uh, can have such impacts if your ideas are very original. And we heard yesterday about some really original ideas of uh, Sasha, and today I will explain his uh, work on this, which is a two-page paper, mind you, and I will get into the history a little bit. Uh, the path I will take is the one uh, that Sasha set up, meaning uh, the setting will be on a Riemannian manifold. There are many directions, other directions that this has taken. I will not do that. This is not supposed to be a, a survey of the subject. It's just a history according to uh, me. <laughs> and I see there are a lot of experts whose work I will mention. Uh, in these kind of Zoom talks, it's, uh, you know, you, I'm just talking to my computer here. Uh, Dima said, uh, wait till the end. Feel free to interrupt if he lets you or put in chat. Uh, I'm, I encourage that. It's nice to have interaction. All right, so let me start. So the papers of Sasha Schnellmann that I want to talk about are these papers, uh, 1974, a two-page paper by the title of Ergodic Properties of Eigenfunctions. There's a second paper that he wrote called Statistical Properties of Eigenfunctions uh, that would, uh, was part of this conference where he announced the result. And that paper, I guess, was published you know, maybe a year before. It's an eight-page paper with more details. Uh, uh, but I think very few people had ever seen that paper until much more recently. The second paper that I'll mention only briefly here, because uh, while it's a great paper, it's in a direction that is more standard. It's about multiplicity of eigenfunctions in situations which are near integrable. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, Sasha wrote uh, an appendix in Lazutkin's book on KM theory and semi-classical approximations to eigenfunctions, where he gives all the details of his proofs of these two papers, which uh, uh, I guess before were a little bit sketchy. All right, let me give you the setting. So the setting of these papers, and I'll stick to this, is not a general Hamiltonian in the Hamiltonian mechanics, but simply the geodesic motion on the cotangent bundle of a compact Riemannian manifold. So we'll write the spectrum. Okay, let me use my cursor. We'll write the spectrum uh, I usually write lambda, but I'll write T here, especially because everybody here is more physics oriented and it's anyway the, the right notation, yeah? So Tj squared are the eigenvalues and the Ts, um, these numbers T, which I'll uh, use to denote the square roots of the eigenvalues, the frequencies, uh, the way I've written Laplacian are, and I choose these are positive numbers and they go off to infinity at a rate that is dictated by Weyl's law. Uh, I'll stick to dimension two for most part, though, uh, and uh, Sasha st stuck to negative curvature, in fact, but he quickly pointed out that what he was doing only required, at least for his theorem, ergodicity. Now, the period in which this was written, there was a, a great advance in the theory of quasi-modes. Those are approximate eigenfunctions with specific definitions, and people were making uh, quasi-modes using WKB methods and uh, methods like that. Uh, to uh, I, making high frequency eigenfunctions associated with periodic orbits, for example, stable periodic orbits, 
It was a, uh, Lazutkin wrote some uh, important papers here, James Ralston, Colin de Verdier about uh, associating uh, quasi-modes to invariant tori. And this was a very active uh, uh, area being developed rapidly. This is the setting in which Sasha, I think, arrives in the subject. And his paper three, which I'll say uh, only one thing about, is about a perturbation of a flat torus where he shows that there's a persistent multiplicity. In fact, the multiplicity is so powerful that um, the diff uh, he conjectures you could prove this with uh, the difference between the consecutive eigenvalues. So basically the flat torus has a multiplicity, high multiplicity in at least two from the time reversal uh, for each eigenvalue. And that persists in this uh, form where it's the eigenvalue to an arbitrary negative power. And one should really believe that uh, TK minus TK minus one will be uh, so small that N there is an arbitrary large power. So that is to say that you can't, uh, with, this, uh, with a perturbation which is small in some smooth norm in order to apply KM theory in order to construct these quasi-modes, though his idea is a, a bit more advanced than that, you cannot shake this multiplicity. Let me just say one thing about this, because I've always wanted myself to try and formulate a uh, generalization of Uhlenbeck's theorem, which asserts that if you have a compact manifold and you look at all the metrics on it, then generically the spectrum is simple. So you might think, if you have some experience in this direction, that maybe the generic metric satisfies a Diophantine condition, the kind of Diophantine condition you see in KM theory, that is to say that the spacings is bigger than the eigenvalue to some fixed negative power. But this kind of feature here, which shows that when you're near, at least in dimension two near torus, that there's no hope of that. And I've never found a satisfactory way to try formulate the uh, generalization of Uhlenberg, which would capture Diophantine property just the same. All right, uh, I now want to turn to the main topic. And that's this paper the first paper, the two-page paper, came out of the blue. It's got the characteristic originality of Sasha's work that we heard yesterday. Just out of the blue, an amazing statement that I, I don't know was predicted, at least in the mathematics community. So the idea of constructing these kind of functions and measures is not new, but the idea of using it in an ingenious way is. So if we have an eigenfunction phi t on our compact manifold, we can formulate this prob well-known probability density. I assume my eigenfunction is L2 normalized, so this is a probability density on the manifold X. And the question that he's going to address is how do these measures distribute themselves as the eigenvalue goes to infinity? And the fact that he can say anything is kind of striking because uh, it, uh, this is a compact, uh, especially in the ergodic or chaotic case, very hard to analyze these things and they are natural thresholds in any kind of study of this type. Just to form these, uh, one wouldn't be able to say much. So he makes what I call, what many people call, a micro local lift of this measure to the unit cotangent bundle, which is where the geodesic flow with a Hamiltonian dynamic. So you obviously should go to phase space and he does that obviously. And so you take a smooth function on the cotangent space and uh, we think of it as a degree zero function on the full cotangent space. So it's a function on the unit cotangent space and make it degree zero. And we can make a pseudo differential operator associated with it. It's not unique, but for the purposes of what I'm doing over here, the non-uniqueness will disappear in the T limit, in this high energy limit. So it's not an issue. And he addresses that in uh, various discussions. And he forms these micro local lifts, mute, T, mu t, the mu is the one on the manifold, nu t is the one on the cotangent space, which is uh, a linear functional in A, but you can symmetrize, he mentions Friedrich symmetrization, and you can symmetrize and make this a probability measure, which is not the exact same measure, but in the, again in the limit because of uh, asymptotics uh, of pseudo differential calculus, you can easily show that this uh, symmetrized uh, measure Distribution is positive and is a measure. So we have probability measures mu t and nu t. The one on the manifold that is the naive one, the micro local lift. And the question he asks is how do they behave in the semi classical limit? And this is his theorem. 
Schneerman, and I call it the quantum egodicity theorem because it's exactly for quantum mechanics what egodic geodesic flow is for classical mechanics. He formulates it and uh, states the theorem in his two-page paper. So if the geodesic flow on X is egodic, so that is to say the only invariant measures for the geodesic flow in the unit cotangent space is the Liouville measure, the volume form in this Riemannian case, then for almost all eigenfunctions, almost all, if we num number the eigenvalues as Tj, then uh, in the sense of numbering J means density one subsequence of the eigenvalues, these measures will converge to the Liouville measure. So uh, in the sense that a classical mechanical system is egodic means almost all orbits are equidistributed. equidistributed. The analog here is that almost all quantum observables, which are what these micro local lifts are, or today let's call them Schneerlmann measures. I should add that certainly uh, this kind of measure was uh, formulated in contexts of classical quantum mechanics by Wigner. But in this context and the use of this, this is Schneerlmann's uh, remarkable theorem. And it really came out of the blue, I believe. By the way, there, I was not around. I'm telling you the story as I see it and as I've heard it. So some history. The 1974 announcement had little in the way of proofs. It just was an announcement with some references. One reference was to the Banimovic Stadium, which I'll return to. The 1973 paper has uh, quite a bit more detail. And had that been well known, I think the result would have been known much more quickly. So this is the early 70s. Colin de Verrier gave a, an absolutely beautiful report on Schneerman's theorem, in fact, giving a uh, elegant and the treatment that most people give today. He gave a complete proof. He reconstructed the proof from, I assume, the announcement. And he also clarified a few things about densities and things like that in his report to the seminar in the Polytechnique. Uh, I think uh, Colin de Verlier, who used the word remarkable theorem, indicates how this came out of the blue. Uh, Conversely, I know that uh, Schneelmann wrote to Colin de Verlier uh, congratulating him on a very beautiful treatment of his theorem and doing the difficult work of finding many missing details that were not given in the original discussion. In any event, uh, it took another 10 years for it to become well known in the West. As I say, I think the paper number two, but every, I believe that everybody I'm talking about here is in the audience here and they can correct me at any point they want. My own personal uh, experience with this came through Steve Zeldich, who I met in New York in the early 80s, and who told me about this theorem, and he was reconstructing a proof himself from the two-page paper. And he concentrated in the setting that I love, so I listen to him a lot, that is of a hyperbolic surface, so the curvature is not just negative. Can, 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 I, can I, it's uh, yeah. Colin de Verde, I can ask, uh, uh, make a remark. In yeah. fact, I was informed of this uh, result by Schneerlmann by Zeldich himself. One ah. day, Zeldich come, came in my office in Grenoble and uh, he was uh, uh, presented to me this uh, Schneerlmann uh, result. Okay. okay. Uh, in fact, I understand that. So the order here should be Zeldich before Colin de Verrier. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, in fact, I also learned it from Zeldich, but Zeldich was only looking at that point anyway. Uh, over the years, he certainly has looked at every version of this uh, gen generalization of this theorem possible, uh, but he was looking at constant curvature. And in fact, uh, in the case of constant curvature, he made canonical quantizations by using that the unit cotangent bundle is then the group SL2R over gamma, the unit cotangent bundle to X. And so he made a he developed a pseudo differential calculus with the representation theory of SL2R, and this predates some uh, ideas that will come later. And so his view is important to me. And so as Eldridge should be there in this history. Thank you very much. And soon after these works in the mid 80s or 85, 86, there were generalizations to manifolds with boundary, to semi classic with manifolds with boundary by Gerard and Leichmann. And then the semi classical versions, which are not just geodesic flow, uh, where you have Hamiltonians, 
by uh, Helfer, Robert, and Martinez, and Z Zeldich and Zawoski as well in the semi-classics. So this had a tremendous impact, this two-page paper of uh, Schneelmann, and I want to discuss uh, developments since then. In fact, let me say two words about the ingredients. The first ingredient is uh, a very important and useful fact that uh, is mentioned in uh, Schnurman's uh, two-page paper, but not proved, and that is the, the following, that any weak limit, so if we take these measures on the unit cotangent bundle, and we, so that space of measures is weak star compact, and you take any weak limit, from now on I'll call those a quantum limit, such a quantum limit actually must be geodesic flow invariant. Now there are many invariant measures under the geodesic flow, so this doesn't classify this by any means, but it's a very powerful statement. And the proof is uh, this expression here, which I believe is uh, Schnellmann's big idea. And that is that if you uh, conjugate by e to the, by the wave operator, uh, this is a Fourier integral operator, so by Egorov's theorem, he doesn't mention Egorov's theorem, but certainly uh, later this uh, treatments do. Uh, by Egorov's theorem, the uh, up to a lower order term when the t goes to infinity, the propagation of singularities will move. This equals that up to lower order terms where you've just flowed the uh, symbol, uh, the function a by the geodesic flow. And since phi t is an eigenfunction, I can bring that to that side. This doesn't change. So it's just simply Egorov's theorem and a little bit of Fourier integral operators propagation of singularities, which is enough to show that any quantum limit is geodesic flow invariant. That's a great insight. The ergodicity is used, say, in Birkhoff's form, but you can use it in other forms. But then there's a third argument, which is this density one of eigenfunctions, which in uh, Schneelmann's first formulation is done in a very uh, very smooth form with the exponential, as it is also in Collin and de, de Verdier's. But later treatments and the ones that are uh, um, I think uh, explain things very clearly are due to Zeldich, and he uh, first put the power one here, but it's quite natural to put the power two, and it's to compute these quantum variances. So if you fix a function, a smooth function on the unit cotangent bundle, and you form the quantum variance, which is the sum up to all the eigenvalues up to t of the Schneerlmann measure at a minus the equidistributed level measure, and you square that, then what is proved, the way you prove all, uh, this density one, is you prove this variance is little o of the number of terms up to t, then you diagonalize over a, and you get the almost all result. But this variance is a very natural quantity. I'll call it the quantum variance. Zeldich has highlighted it as, uh, I think, and I agree with him completely, is the natural way to go here. So those are key ingredients in the proof. Yeah, okay. Those are key ingredients in the proof. So they are immediate questions which Nehrman, of course, uh, leaves hanging, but we'll hear maybe from him what his views are. So the question that you must ask when you see this are, what are the possible quantum limits? They must be GT invariant, and what could be a quantum limit? This is, uh, they, cannot, they cannot be a more interesting question in my view. Now, numerical experiments were not known, I believe, that early, but they already were well known in the 1980s by many, many people. And in particular for the Banimovich Stadium, there were quite a few numerical calculations done. And as I said, curi curiously, uh, Sasha mentions uh, the Banimovich Stadium as an example. I think that's because he probably was quite friendly with Banimovich and Sinai. Uh, he, maybe he can clarify later. Anyway, it's an example which is a little bit complicated, as I'll show you some pictures right now. And uh, there were some obvious quantum limits that you see immediately. I'm going to show you a picture now. But there were some other ones became known as scarring, which might be uh, quantum limits on unstable periodic orbits. And if such things exist, this is really uh, unexpected. Just as a matter of interest, many years later, Hassel showed that in the stadium that I'm about to show you, uh, there are non-trivial, even this is a non, uh, highly tricky problem and he solved it quite cleverly, that there are no, limits which are not the Liouville measure. So of course the Liouville measure is one of the limits by Schneelmann's theorem because the Banimovich stadium, this is the Banimovich stadium, is ergodic. That's Banimovich's big insight to prove this is an ergodic billiard table. 
All right, so here's a sequence of eigenfunctions, and it's plain from this that you see Schneelmann's theorem in action. This is the absolute square. This is just the uh, projection, the measure nu, what I called nu, not the micro local lift. So it's just phi squared and where it's concentrated. So you can see most of them are spread all over. They're becoming equidistributed. That's Schneelmann's theorem on a density one subsequence. But it's clear there are these bouncing ball modes here. They're obviously there, and one, there's no surprise there. And they actually will be about square root of the total number of them are bouncing ball modes. They're quite common. The feature that uh, was pointed to by uh, most notably maybe Heller is that there may be states that are concentrated on unstable periodic orbits. So he has an example, maybe the best that he has or from these days. Now I've seen pictures since they uh, just highlight the, the phenomenon. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to me anything really new. Uh, the question that we're asking here is, could these limits concentrate on an unstable periodic orbit? Or perhaps could they uh, land up giving some mass to positive mass to an unstable periodic orbit? And if that were true, you would say that uh, whatever a scar is, that would be a very serious scar. I think that scars don't exist in the limit. One can debate this in this context. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at a case where we don't have bouncing ball modes to confuse us, because this is not a uniformly hyperbolic system. And in fact, as I said, Schneerman himself uh, formulated his theorem in negative curvature just to make the purest picture. And then we can see all the features. All right. In Colin de Varier's Le Houge lectures on this, uh, he highlights what I view as the real basic question. Could there be a, qu a quantum limit? Could it concentrate on an unstable periodic orbit in the negatively curved case? From now on, I'll stick to compact manifolds with negative curvature. So he has a closed geodesic. This is supposed to be part of a hyperbolic surface. And Colin asks, is it possible that uh, Eves asked, I should say, is it possible for the eigenfunction to concentrate there? And he shows that you cannot locally, that means of compact support, ignoring the sides here, build a quantum limit that will live only on there. So looks like not. But on the other hand, if you make a surface of revolution so that the dynamics here sort of fix up this problem, you can have a quantum limit, which is this periodic orbit. But if you're in negative curvature, this is what he asked as to me the basic question. Could you have a, the most singular invariant measure under the geodesic flow be a quantum limit? All right, and that's a question we're going to try address here. Uh, that historically, that was addressed. So I'll stick to X of negative curvature. And I should say that when you're in negative curvature, just like you can improve Weyl's law a tiny bit, for the count of the number of geodesics so in dimension two, I'll stick to dimension two. Now this is in any dimension. Then the quantum variances, which was the way you proved the positive density. And now we're trying to quantify the quantum variance for a uh, symbol A, for a fixed symbol A. A is fixed in this kind of thing. Then the quantum variance was little o of n of t is what Schneelmann's theorem gives, but uh, you can prove something a little stronger in the negatively curved case. You make this modest improvement of a log. And it's an interesting question. What's the true size of the variance? And we will try to address that. All right. Now, at this point, uh, I'm going to go a little, quite a long way. Let me see I've taken 24 minutes. Good. Uh, I'm going to go in a direction which is arithmetic. Now, that's because that's where I come from. And that's where, cause we, where we have the most powerful results. And then I'll return to the general case. Uh, so there's a very good reason to do this, and I know this audience is not arithmetically uh, inclined, perhaps. So from that point of view, I'm going to only explain some concepts and explain why this particular problem of Schneerman uh, is intimately connected to the most interesting things that we uh, address in the arithmetic of these surfaces, which are studied because of number for number theoretic re reasons, completely independently. So the basic difficulty in this problem is if we try to look at individual eigenfunctions, which is what I'm trying to do, then there may be multiple eigenvalues. 
And we have, and it's a very disappointing fact that we have no way to bound the multiplicity of the eigenvalues rigorously. If you actually look at any of these problems, the multiplicity is usually one unless there's a symmetry. And then it's bounded even if there's a symmetry in these negatively curved cases. So nobody sees multiplicities, but we have no tools. It's connected with the limits uh, of the trace formula and error press time. There's no tools to really do anything substantial without, uh, it, presently we have no tools. And that's why this uh, remainder term in Weyl's law is so weak and the multiplicity is the best bound. The best bound for multiplicity is the one that we have in Weyl's law. That's a bit embarrassing. But that's the fact. So it's also just T of a log T in dimension two. And if there's very high multiplicity, as big as T over log T, then you could imagine that uh, if I want to say something about an individual eigenfunction, I could take linear combinations if the space is so big and make the function look anything like anything I want it to look like. And that's a, uh, a problem. And we have to get around that. And any solution to this problem has to get around that. And arithmetic gets around it in a very clean way. So if we specialize, and this, of course, when you specialize, uh, you better do better in terms of what you can prove. Uh, but it's to understand this phenomenon and these uh, arithmetic manifolds, I won't define them, but they are like the modular group. They are countably many of them. And I'll give you one at the very end, a very exact triangle with some amazing properties. But anyway, these arithmetic ones have extra features. And the extra feature they have is they don't have ordinary symmetries, that is isometries as a, as a hyperbolic surface but they have correspondences. These are isometries that are defined on finite coverings or what you might view as multi-valued symmetries. And there are many of them. And because of these symmetries, one cre can create a natural family of geometric operators which commute with the Laplacian and commute with each other. That's the main feature of this arithmetic. And this extra commutation allows you to basically choose a unique orthonormal basis. And if I ever say anything about the eigenfunction on arithmetic surface, it will be an eigenfunction of these Hecker operators as well. So what the arithmetic does is it gives us a way to resolve this multiplicity by choosing an orthonormal basis, which are simultaneous eigenfunction. But in fact, since the spectrum is no doubt simple here, this probably is unnecessary anyway. But this is how we get around that fundamental difficulty and it opens the door. And in general, one has to explain how you get around uh, the difficulty of the high multiplicity and uh, we, I'll discuss it when we get there. But in this arithmetic case, I, we br can bring in other tools from uh, number theory and also ergodic theory. And we demand and we will get much stronger results on Schneelmann's uh, measures. So I'll discuss the arithmetic case. So it was in this context that Rudnick and I were reading uh, uh, Colin de Verdier's Le Hoosh notes. And he asked whether this, uh, whether you could have in a hyperbolic surface, a quantum limit, which is maybe a union, a singular measure supported on these finite number of closed geodesics, the arc length measure. And because of these heck operators, we found a very simple proof that the singular support of such a limit of a quantum limit cannot be contained in a finite union of closed geodesics, answering his question, at least in that case. And then based on that and various developments that I'm going to show you in a minute that we knew anyway that made us very confident about our conjecture in one case, we made this conjecture that in fact in negative curvature, so this uh, I'm sure that Michael Berry and uh, Bogomolny, if he's here, will argue with me about being so bold as to make this in the variable negative curvature, but we made this conjecture and so far it's survived handsomely. And that is that if you're in the uniformly hyperbolic setting, that is a strictly negatively curved surface, we stick just to hyperbolic surfaces, sorry, negatively curved surfaces. So that's where we're sticking our neck out, that there's only one limit. And that in quantum mechanics, you can never see at this uh, level any periodic orbits. You only see the Liouville measure in the quantum limits. So the only Schneelmann limits are Liouville measure. Uh, we had very strong evidence, as you'll see in a second, that this is true in the arithmetic case, and in fact it is true, and so that is in fact the theorem, but in the variable negative curvature, this remains uh, very much open and perhaps debatable. All right, now the reason the subject attracted certainly my attention 
uh, and all my efforts at the time, is that the Schnirlmann measures, these uh, um, op A, phi J, phi J, have an absolutely beautiful interpretation in terms of the central objects in modern automorphic forms. You don't need to know what they are, but I'll ask you to believe one thing, that there's a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis of Riemann to all automorphic L functions. And that if you know that Riemann hypothesis, then all questions here are basically solved. Not all, but the central question is solved dramatically. And this is done by an amazing formula of a student of mine, Tom Watson, his thesis 1994. The reason I say that is he left math and uh, his thesis is only uh, in, uh, in, in the library here and also on the archive. Later, Papers have, re, have also proved this, but it was he, he, he made this key breakthrough in proving this in this generality that we need. And that is, if you take these arithmetic settings, and remember, A is a function on the unit cotangent bundle. So you could assume that A itself is an eigenfunction of the Hecker operators. So you choose special A's, but they are, there's an orthonormal basis of them. So if you take the observable to be a Hecker eigenfunction, then the Schnirlmann measure squared, the number that Schnirlmann proves for most go to zero, uh, that for each individual guy, remember we now in the world of individual because we have this Hecker basis, is actually the special value of an L function associated with the eigenfunction TJ and with the symbol A. And I'm not expecting anybody to know anything about this except to note that it's at the center of the critical strip, the point one half, uh, the rest is explicit. And that surely reflects the decay rate of this in terms of the size of this L function. And while we don't know how to prove much about these L functions, and that's where the subject went, uh, we do know what to expect. And that's the beauty of the Riemann hypothesis. It's complete in when it uh, tells us the truth. Uh, this decays like t to the minus one half. So that is, if you assume the Riemann hypothesis for any L function that might come your way, and there's strong belief of that. This was the reason we were quite confident. Then the Schnirlmann measure for a fixed A, and you can see the dependence on A2, decays like the, energy, the eigenvalue to the minus a half individually. So not only uh, do you decay, for, uh, but you decay at some rate, and so you have quantum unique by this, and you have the whole story with, and this is exactly sharp, as you will see in a minute. So the QU for X only needs not this sharp bound, it only needs a subconvex bound that's something weaker. And uh, let me just say that those weaker versions were proved for the continuous spectrum by Lua and myself and Jakobsen. So we proved this QUE in that case, and I was able to deal with dihedral forms. But just because we formulated this in terms of fancy language and L functions doesn't mean that we make progress. So this is a translation, and then you have to do something significant. And this remains unsolved to prove a subconvex estimate for this function. It remains the central unsolved problem, in my view, in the theory of automorphic L function. Of course, the big problem is Riemann, but let's be real. All right. So uh, it stood there where we knew QUE in many cases in the arithmetic case. Let me spend two slides on a dramatic development by uh, a Gothic theory of a different type. And I'll explain this, and this may be, uh, will be much clearer, especially to those who, uh, like Schnurman, whose main observation was the invariance of the quantum limit under the geodesic flow. We now are in this arithmetic case where we are an eigenfunction, not just of the Laplacian, but also of these Hecker operators. So maybe a quantum limit, which is a, a measure on the space, and the geodesic flow in this case of uh, constant curvature is just the diagonal flow, as uh, you can easily work out. Maybe in this case, the eigenfunction also has an extra invariance. And the answer is, yes, it does. It's quite, kind of subtle, and I'll explain it in the simplest case. And it's the case in which uh, I think it was uh, Linden Strauss and I first uh, discussed this. So you will see Linden Strauss come into this dramatically. So instead of looking at uh, a surface, a Riemann surface, let's take the upper half plane cross the upper half plane divided by an irreducible lattice, not a product of two curves, but the gamma sit side is a discrete subgroup of the product of SL2R with itself. 
and it's irreducible. So it's twisted in an irreducible way. So-called Hilbert modular space is an example. All right, you can look at this case just like before on the space Y, we have then the Laplacian in the first coordinate in Z1 and the Laplacian in the second coordinate. And the, or the Laplacian, if we were just looking at Riemannian geometry would be the sum of the two. But the Laplacian in the first coordinate makes sense on that quotient. The, the, all the twisting has got to do with the gamma, not with the Z1 and Z2. So it's H cross H over gamma. So these two Laplacians, these two operators commute with each other. And so, just like with, this is kind of a baby heck operator, if you want to think of it that way, because they commute with each other, we can demand that our eigenfunction also be an eigenfunction of each one separately, and we do. And you would hope that because you are an eigenfunction of the separate operators, delta one, delta two, you would have an invariance which is bigger than just the diagonal, uh, the geodesic flow. So in this case, you don't make the micro local lift to the unit tangent bundle. It's more natural to make it to the natural, uh, a bigger space on which you can make this projection back to the measure. So you make the measure in what I call news phi squared and you micro local lift it to this SL2R cross SL2R over gamma. And the definition is very similar to what uh, Schneelmann made. And you do it here and then you find an amazing extra invariance that instead of just being the, the quantum limit, any weak star limit of these, instead of being just invariant under the diagonal action, there are two diagonals here in the space naturally, the one in the first coordinate and the second coordinate, and your measures actually invariant under this full two rank two diagonal subgroup. And you might say, so what? You made a bigger space, you have more invariance. Aha, there's an amazing conjecture of Furstenberg, tremendous insight that the minute you have such uh, diagonal actions which are rank two or higher, things should rigidify. There should be only the obvious measures which are invariant. So you've bought a tremendous rigidity at, by getting this extra invariance. And that opens the door. And in fact, Lyndon Strauss, uh, one of the first cases he was able to prove of QGE was this product case. So in general, this conjecture of uh, Furstenberg has amazingly been proved by Einzitz, Akatok, and Lyndon Strauss, but they have to add a fundamental extra assumption. And that is that the measure, the quantum limit, the, the measure which is invariant under this action should have positive kolmogorov sinai entropy at least for one element in the flow. So I said, all the measures are obvious, but you, uh, and you should not have to assume this positive entropy extra assumption. And in many of the works of uh, Einzika Katok and Lyndon Strauss, they can't get around this, so they have to do something else or make some assumptions. But in this particular problem, there's a miracle. And uh, Lyndon Strauss uh, develops the theory, the, uh, the, 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 instead of taking a product of two uh, uh, SL2R cross SL2R, this is where the heck operator TP comes in. So he only needs one other heck operator, but he does need the following. He does need this positive entropy. And in a lovely paper with joint with Jean Bourguin, Lyndon Strauss, alone Lyndon Strauss, was able to prove that any quant any egotic component, let me emphasize this, every egotic component of a quantum limit must have positive entropy. And that's a completely different argument. And in fact, it's a generalization of my original argument with Rudnick when we showed you can't concentrate on a finite number of closed geodesics. They quantify that and get Hausdorff dimension slightly bigger than one, which gives you this positive entropy on every egotic component. Let me emphasize that again. And that allows Lyndon Strauss to complete the entire circle and uh, approve what I view as a fantastic achievement. This is probably 2006 or so, that the quantum unique egotistic conjecture is true for arithmetic axes. And this is a, an amazing statement that uh, Schneelmann uh, measures become equidistributed individually. So uh, this is uh, uh, the major advance in the arithmetic case. And in fact, uh, in terms of the variance, the quantum variance, it too can be solved completely in arithmetic cases. So remember that, uh, so in arithmetic cases, is everybody there? Uh, can somebody just confirm that I'm not- Yes, to yes, okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> you, get, you get a little worried. 
when you don't hear anything except a, a baby saying hi. <laughs> That's great. Um, so uh, let's return to the uh, variances, the, the variance, the quantum variance that Zeldich used in his proof of uh, Schneelmann's theorem. So um, again, in, uh, in let me just talk about classical variance for a quick second. So suppose I have a negatively curved uh, manifold like uh, surface, uh, K is variable negative curvature, and I have a function on the unit cotangent bundle whose mean is zero. And you can look at the following function on the real line, one over square root T, the average, va the average value of this function along the orbit, uh, where I start at a random point V in the sense of almost all V respect to legal measure. Then the theorem of Ratner, this is a theorem of Ratner, that this variable, this random variable is Gaussian. And the thing I want to emphasize here, so the classical, you've got a square root T, that's very similar to what you'll see in a second. And the question is, what's the uh, quadratic form in A? What's the variance? It's a quadratic form of A on, in A, uh, where, where the mean of A is zero. It's the following integral. You take the, the integral over the space, the unit cotangent bundle of A shifted by tau, by the geodesic flow by tau times A. So this is a mixing, this is a mixing, uh, condition. And then you integrate that from minus infinity to infinity. Because the integral of A is zero, this, act, this mixing rate actually for the geodesic flow in these set things decays rapidly enough that this integral converges absolutely. And this gives you a quadratic form of A on functions on, uh, of mean zero on the tangent bundle. And that's the classical variance, this quadratic form in A. So remember that under the generalized Riemann hypothesis, the decay of the uh, Schnell, uh, Schnellmann measures for a fixed A is Tj to the minus a half. I told you that would follow from that, uh, from the Riemann hypothesis. And the remarkable thing is in this arithmetic case, you can actually compute the quantum variance. That is, you can compute the, average, the mean of A is zero. If you take op A phi J phi J squared, and you sum it, remember that Zeldich in general proved uh, the, the number of eigenvalues in dimension two, I'm in dimension two here, is t squared. So he proved t squared over log t. In fact, consistent with this, this is a constant times t. And that constant is, you might believe, the classical uh, variance. And in fact, I think Fishman has some conjecture in the physics literature uh, along these lines. Anyway, this is a case where you can actually compute the quantum variance, prove it rigorously, uh, that's what we do. And we find remarkably that in this case, you've got two quadratic forms, the classical variance and the quantum variance in this theorem. They're not equal, but they are both diagonalized. So in A, this observable is on a function of mean zero on the unit cotangent space, which is SL2R. So you can decompose SL2R mod gamma into irreducible representations in the sense of representation theory of SL2R. And on each irreducible, these two quadratic and these two quadratic forms are diagonalized by those irreducibles. And on each irreducible, they differ by only a constant. It's infinite dimensional spaces. These two quadratic forms agree completely up to a constant, and that constant is a absolutely beautiful number. It's the special value of the L function of that irreducible at a half, and it could be zero, shockingly, uh, so that the quantum variance could be zero. While the classic, for very deep reasons, while the classical variance is uh, not zero. So we understand uh, the Schneerman, or at least the Zeldich variances, completely in the arithmetic case. All right, now let me turn to the general case. So for a long time, there was no, or I would say, little progress on uh, what could happen in variable negative curvature because. There's a really fundamental breakthrough uh, br threshold of this Aaron press time that you can't get past, meaning you can use semi classics to construct the way I think about everything is in terms of geometric optics. You can construct a parametric, so lax parametrics to these equations for time, bounded time for the wave equation. But the minute you allow uh, the time to get larger, you have an exponential number of periodic orbits and uh, you can't uh, analyze those rigorously. You can analyze them heuristically, but not rigorously. That's for Michael Berry, who's, uh, see, who I noticed the beginning is here. 
Uh, so that's a real problem. So how to overcome that? And uh, there was amazing breakthrough by Nalini Anand Tharaman, and also with a follow-up work with Nonan Maka and others. Uh, the follow-up work gave quantitative bounds to the theorem I'm about to uh, announce or uh, display. Uh, and she, uh, I probably, uh, I would guess a little bit influenced by Lyndon Strauss's use of uh, Kolmogorov in Sinai entropy in the arithmetic setting, actually just sat down and uh, found that you can estimate in this negative curvature case, the entropy directly. So you take the measures at finite case, you put down the definition and you try estimate and if you below the error and face time, you can analyze it quite well semi-classically. And she found an ingenious way of extending that just above that in order to get the information I'm about to tell you. And not only does she prove this theorem for uh, eigenfunctions, but she improve, pre proves it for quasi-modes of a certain quality, which is uh, makes sense because she's not getting around the multiplicity issue. She's getting around it only at uh, combinatorial level. So let me state a theorem. It's an absolutely stunning theorem. Let X be a compact Riemannian manifold of negative sectional curvature, the case that we've been talking about. Then any quantum limit must have Kolmogorov Sinai and positive Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. That's a fantastic statement because it tells you that the quantum limit cannot be too singular or too simple. By the way, notice it does not say that the entropy of every ergodic component has to be positive. So this is not a replacement in, in uh, Lyndon Strauss's work of his work with Bergen. Um, but it is still an amazing statement. And finally, re resolves Colin de Verrier's beautiful question of whether you can, uh, in negative curvature, concentrate on a closed geodesic. And the answer is not even on a convex combination of closed geodesics because such a measure, such a Kolmogorov entropy of a rotation of a circle is zero. Um, we will hear in five minutes, I said, because I thought I'd be five minutes away and I'm 10 minutes away, so that's good, uh, by Simeon Dertloff on another use of a very, uh, you always have to introduce a new idea to get around this threshold, something that uh, he and Bergen call the fractal uncertainty principles. So I won't say much more about that. You'll, I assume, be hearing about it in a, in a few minutes, but it also gives uh, results about the possible quantum limits in negative curvature and specifically the topological closure of such of the support of such a measure. All right, I'll end by saying there are many applications of quantum ergodicity and quantum unique ergodicity, and they often enter as a tool with together with other ingredients such as restriction theorems and other arguments that are special LP bounds. And I want to give you two because uh, I find them to be the most attractive in that uh, it seems extremely difficult to say anything about nodal domains for a hyperbolic manifold or for a negatively curved manifold or something where you can't write down the eigenfunctions explicitly. And in particular for a hyperbolic triangle. So this will be the hyperbolic triangle I'm going to discuss now. It's got angle pi over two, pi over six and pi over six compact. I'm going to look at the eigenfunctions with the Richler and Neumann and those angles are miracle angles. This is an arithmetic group. And the spectrum of an arithmetic group is exactly the kind of arithmetic group that I've been talking about with these Hecker operators. And it, it was discovered by Schmidt and Bogomolny early, early on and others that, but Schmidt and Bogomolny, I think you know, Bogomolny certainly to my great amazement discovered the notion of an arithmetic group to explain this phenomenon that the spacings are Poisson and not GOE, but I don't want to go in that direction. So there's an arithmetic triangle and you can ask about the, how many nodal domains the eigenfunctions have. And he has a theorem. Uh, Gauss, Resnikov and I had to assume the Riemann hypothesis, something much weaker, but we had to assume it in our proof. And then uh, Jang and Jung were able to give an unconditional proof by uh, running part of the argument in a quite ingeniously different way. So this is a theorem that for this arithmetic triangle in the Richler and Neumann eigenfunctions, the number of nodal domains goes to infinity with the eigenvalue. It's very hard to create nodal domains in an explicit thing like this. So I find this to be quite striking. And one of the ingredients, there are many ingredients, is 
Linden Strauss's quantum unique ecodicity. So that's an individual statement. Each eigenfunction must develop more and more nodal domains. And that's a global count, so that's pretty pleasing. And I'll end with a similar theorem, which will have all the flavors of Sasha's work. If you have a, 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 a many variants and one of the recent variants, which is extremely useful of this quantum ergodicity theorem is called the quantum ergodic restriction theorem. That's due to Christensen, Zeldich, Hass, and Hassel and Toth. They look at the eigenfunctions on a sequence of density one when restric restricted to certain subsets and show that they can become equidistributed if those subsets have certain conditions. And that's certainly a variant on uh, Schneelmann's original theorem. And using that and this topological idea of uh, Ghost, Reznikov, and myself, and the ideas of uh, Zeldich and uh, Ju, Hazari has proved what I find to be a beautiful theorem. So this is the following, that if you have a compact Riemann surface, Riemannian surface, this is not with a complex structure, with a Riemannian structure and a piecewise smooth boundary. So uh, a domain, uh, poly polygonal domain or something like that, or uh, Banimovich stadium. And if the billiard flow inside the domain is ergodic, that's the only assumption, then there's a density one subsequence of either the Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, each of them, for which the number of nodal domains goes to infinity as you go along the subsequence. So this is the density one version of the previous theorem, but this is very general. And it's exactly uh, in terms of making nodal domains, this is quite remarkable and a beautiful theorem. And for me, it's difficult to imagine a theorem such as Hazari's theorem, if it were not for Sasha formulating his two page paper in 1974. Happy birthday, Sasha, and we wish you many more and many more original ideas that you have given the world of mathematics. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So uh, thank you, Peter, very much for a great talk. Uh, 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 would anyone like to ask questions? Uh, uh, please, please a, ask. I'm sure there are many historical comments here that I have wrong, and I'm, I'm, I'm very... Uh, well, I'd like to uh, make a comment and ask a question. Okay, of course. Let me do it in the opposite order. <laughs> in the theorem where you only know that there's a density, you know, that um, there's the set of exceptions has density zero. Um, I remember yeah, that's, that's your that's all the, that's a Q that's quantum mega Yeah, right? well, suppose you don't have QUE or you don't uh, know. Uh, okay. So my question is the following: um, If you try to figure out the growth rate of the of a possible exceptional sequence a priori, right? Like yeah. how the, you know it goes. You know that the density is zero, but it, you know you don't know exactly how the number of eigenvalues in a subsequence with an anomalous limit, right? If you look at uh, the, uh, su any subsequence where you don't have luvial measure as a limit, the question is, uh, how do, what is the growth rate in, t in the eigenvalues of such a sequence? That's my question. 